everybody. It's a, this is a great occasion because this is the first of, we hope, a long series of PhD seminars. Um, and I'm a bit uh, embarrassed to be standing here to do the introduction. I was hoping that one of the PhD fellows would be doing it. But let's think that next time that will happen. And the, now, since it's the first seminar, I will still be doing it. Can I have, I have one request, since not the entire room is full, can I ask the people who are in the back to come a bit to the front? Because this is supposed to be a debate, and if we're close together, the deep, it will make the deep, debating easier. And then while you're moving, perhaps I can say two sentences about the, the why of the PhD seminar series. I think, Ken, I don't know if you remember, I think it was perhaps already more than a year ago that we started discussing the idea. And the idea actually is, arose because we thought, well, all of us, we have such a great community of bright minds, young bright minds in this institute, the PhD community. All of them do very interesting work in water. All of them are, are young, which means, I, I, at least I think, if you're young, then you're also a bit wild, and you must still have new innovative ideas. But actually, often within the institute, all the work that the PhD community and the, student, the fellows do remains a bit in the margins. We don't see a lot of it. So we thought perhaps it's very nice to have to create an occasion where to put the PhD fellows to meet and discuss how their bits and pieces of research fit together to answer the larger questions that what what questions that we are dealing with. And doing that by inviting people that are inspiring, thought-provoking, that we admire or that we hate, but somehow people in the water world or beyond that can provoke discussion and debate. That was the idea. So I'm very happy that Deepak agreed to come here all the way from Nepal and that Ken agreed, he is what he already that Ken agreed to engage in debate with Deepak. I've known Deepak for a long time. He's a, an old friend in the, let's say, the critical water community. He is um, a hydroelectric electric engineer. That's one part of his training. He was trained in Russia, so he speaks Russian. But he's also a political scientist from the United States, so he combines these two, uh, which is already very interesting. He's me and the CIA both. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is already very interesting, and, and but it's also very interesting that Deepak, for a short period, has been the Minister of Water Resources in Nepal. So he combines many insights, and many experiences, uh, both from different disciplines, from having been in charge of water resources in the country, but also, in a way, and I hope that he will say something about that today, he has also learned a lot from, by being on the receiving end of a lot of development cooperation. And so that gives a very different perspective. What does it mean? How do you negotiate all these development loans and, and grants? And what good does that actually do? Nepal is one of the countries, I don't know what the, the current percentages are, but it's one of the countries that receives a lot of development aid and has, has always received a lot of development aid. So that will give a very interesting perspective. I can say a lot more about BIFA. This is uh, his CV. His CV is very long. It has a very long list of publications. Perhaps I will only say one more thing: is that Deepak is very vocal and very thought provocative and very articulated. So that makes him, I think, a perfect speaker for our first PhD seminar. Um, shall I also 
immediately introduce you, Ken, well, or can I introduce yeah, you when you start? Now, let me also introduce Ken. Most of you already know Ken. Ken Irvin, he's the uh, professor of aquatic ecosystems here in the Institute. He comes from a different disciplinary background, an ecologist. But of course, he, I think he combines with Deepak a deep interest in development, sustainable development. What is it about? How do we do it? Realizing that you can never achieve any sustainable and just development from just a disciplinary angle, that you always need to, to broaden and think about ecology, technology, as well as about society and human beings. So, Ken, I'm very happy that you agreed to, you. to engage in a discussion with, uh, with Deepak. There's a lot more to say also about Ken. Perhaps I also won't do that. I think it will, the debate will speak for itself. So, Deepak, let's give you a big hand. I'm very happy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want both of them? Or perhaps you can go first, Deepak, and then Ken will uh, go to the Yeah, wait a minute. What happened? What happened? Yeah. Three, four. I'll join you later. Okay, uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm reminded of my long, long ago, Utah, 1985, I think, in Berkeley, when uh, we were asked as graduate students to organize our own four credit seminars. And we'd done one on what's called the debate on growth and development. And people still talk about it, you know, today. So it was fun. I, I hope you have as much fun as we did when I was in birthday organizing something like this. Now, wh I, what I want to do is talk to you about um, what is development orthodoxy. I will talk about a little bit about the wickedness of some of these problems that we face. Water, energy, food, climate change, these are all wicked problems. Uh, and then I'll talk about you know why I think the way I do and take an extremely critical attitude towards much of development of orthodoxy from the lived experience in Nepal. Uh, we've uh, seen all kinds of developments come and go. And Nepal has been a laboratory since 1948 when Truman's four-point program was started. And, uh, and then I'll talk about why I have problems with development uh, aid orthodoxy. I will not talk about what needs to be done. I hope you know you get provoked and asked me that I'll come to the debate <laughs> discussion part. I'll come to you know what I think the solutions might be uh, to a better international cooperation uh, phenomenon. Now, development uh, orthodoxy. Uh, let's <coughs> step back. You know, this whole idea of development as we know it uh, was born after the First World War, uh, Second World War, sorry. Uh, it did exist before that. And it came uh, with the, uh, you know, the, the close of the Second World War with uh, the Cold War as it started. And that's where with Marshall Plan in Europe, you know, uh, somebody got the bright idea that if Europe could be, you know, put back on its feet and developed after the devastation of the war uh, with something like Marshall Plan, uh, well, why don't we do it for the rest of the world and, you know, you have development. The trouble was, you know, Europe was, in the case of Europe, the institutions of quote-unquote development, you know, the market, the laws, the insurance, the banking, everything was in place. It had been shattered by the war, but it was like a wounded animal being healed that all you needed was a little bit of infusion of money and things like that. In the global south, or what used to be called the third world, uh, you're talking about creating that animal in the first place. It's not a wounded animal that needs to be healed with a little bit of infusion of money. So there's a huge problem, and these last 50, 60 years, we have seen a huge disjunction in that practice. Okay. So, uh, it started with Truman's four-point program in 1948, just after the war, and Nepal was one of the first countries where this was started. Key to it was one, you know, a focus on market, you know, and uh, also a focus on sort of like parliamentary democracy or whatever as the solution, markets and parliamentary democracy as solutions. You know. 
it hasn't worked in many parts of the world. On the contrary, it has actually led to a collapse of democracy often. Uh, it has led to all kinds of uh, uh, you know, malfeasance, you might say. One big problem there has been in this orthodoxy that uh, development is seen as economic and not socio-political. And that is one of the problems, that politics has been sanitized. Okay? Now, development is highly political. Uh, it is very difficult, uh, uncomfortable, but it has to be done. It also ignores uh, the informal ground reality, or what we choose to call towards eye science. You have eagle eye science, and you have towards eye science. I mean, I do both, but these days I'm getting to be more of a towards eye scientist. Uh, I like to go down to the village and see actually what is happening down there. Uh, but a lot of the work, including a lot of academic work, is just confined to this massive, you know, global GPS data and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's necessary to have some perspective, but it loses the connection to the ground. And as a result, you end up with something that's very, very imperfect, okay? The other uh, problem has been with development orthodoxy. It's not fixed. It changes, but changes in the wrong way, okay? There's a shifting of goals and ambitions, and I'll talk about how, what has happened in Nepal. But this goal setting is all top down. And seems to miss that towards eye perspective of what is it that people really want down there. And that has been a chronic persistence problem, persistent problem with the aid industry, as I call it. Uh, weakness, you all know what that is, I'm sure, you know, it's the fact that, you know, there's a different interpretation by different groups of what the problem is. Uh, people can't agree on the definition of the problem itself, of a wicked problem. And uh, when the definite, you can't agree on the definition, you sure as hell are not going to agree on the solution. It goes by itself. I'll give you an example uh, from some, another field, Kathmandu's air pollution is pretty bad. But what is it due to? What is the problem uh, that air pollution arises? <coughs> One set would say it's because of adulterated fuel. You know, people mix kerosene and petrol and make a lot of money, these petrol pump owners. Huh? Uh, the others say it's unpaved road that's kicking up dust all the time. Uh, others say it's overloaded buses and trucks, you know, that carry about two to three times more than they're designed to carry, so the engines don't really combust properly. There also is brick kilns. There's also the normal, you know, burning of agriculture waste in, from North India uh, all the way to Nepal and Bangladesh and Punjab and Pakistan that gives rise to this brown cloud, uh, Asian brown cloud thing. Now, why I'm saying this is important is because, you know, depending on what you define as the problem of air pollution, who is to blame and who is to, uh, where, where the solution has to be found differs. If it's adulterated fuel, you've got to cast the oil suppliers. If it is unpaved roads, you've got to cast the municipality. If it is overloaded buses, the police who are, you know, not looking at uh, this overloading uh, in, in, in highways. If it is brick kills, it's another thing. If it is... Agriculture waste burning, uh, it's industry, it's tradition. How do you handle that? How do you go to every farmer and you know make a policeman after every farmer? So this is where wicked problems are. And <clears throat> neither government institutions in, in, in our kind of countries, nor international development agencies are institutionally so structured as to be able to handle such problems. Not just government ministries that are working in silos and not nexus thinking, but international aid agencies also have their departments and a project promoted by one department as a water supply project refuses to see it also simultaneously as a hydropower project, you know, or uh, a river training project, okay? So this is where the problem lies. Now, Nepal has been a laboratory of aid failure. We like to think of this, uh, we are a pathology lab. You know, you want a disease, you come and see it, you'll see it there, you know. It's, uh, somebody joked that, you know, you come as a tourist in Nepal and go three times around Kathmandu, you can probably get your PhD. Uh, <laughs> it's that bad. We've seen it all, you see. Like I said, it started with Truman in, uh, President Truman in 1948. And since then, uh, a book of ours has come out, and a colleague of mine, Dr. Sunidhar Sharma, has got a brilliant chapter of six decades of uh, aid in Nepal, and how the aid fad has changed every year. Sometimes it's import substitution, sometimes it's export-led, sometimes it's basic needs, and sometimes it's poverty alleviation, sometimes it is this and that. The current fad is climate change. 
Uh, so everything has to be defined in terms of climate change. You know, With gender and climate change, obvious. Education and climate change. You know, justice and climate change. So what is happening now? Somebody joked that you know, if you, if you really want some money, you want money for water supply project. There's no money for that. Define that project as climate change, gender, and water supply, and you'll probably get some money. But that means not touching your nose like this. It's touching your nose like this, and and in the process, all sorts of distortions happen. Now. <coughs> The trouble is, with all the six, seven decades of now foreign aid funding, we are just as bad as before. So the question has to be asked, you know, what went wrong? And some of us are asking this question and we are not getting the answer. It's not that there are no success stories. There are amazing success stories, as we've highlighted in this book. The climate-friendly and mountain-friendly transport system called the ropeways, cable cars, okay? It's consistently ignored. It's already shown that, you know, energy consumption per ton of good transported is about half, you know? But nobody wants to do it. You know, they're so locked in uh, into petroleum and cars and trucks and highways and roads and mountains. It's amazing, you know. The, we've finished a research on why springs are drying across the Himalayas. Sadly for climate folks, it's too early to blame climate change. Yes, when climate change impact becomes worse 50 years down the road, it makes things even worse. But right now, the drivers are something else. I mean, I'll get into it in discussions. Uh, you can also download that report. Electric vehicles. I mean, this is efficiency-wise way you know, beyond the chart. It's so good. But there's a resistance to allowing. There's a whole chapter in our book on electric vehicles and why there's so much resistance from the government. The Nepali environmentalists have to fight their own government to get electric vehicles. Now, why does that happen? And no donor really comes forward. The Dutch did come forward at one point, but then we drew. <laughs> so, uh, there is uh, community electricity, huge success with community electricity, but there's a resistance and several political parties, including the Maoists, now you'd have thought Maoist, community, communes, you know, almost synonymous. The Maoists wanted to shut it down completely. Why? Because this was an organizing principle in the village outside of the Politburo chain of command. <laughs> It's amazing that you look at these kind of things. Small farmer programs, huge success in Nepal, but no donor wanted to pick it up afterwards. So it was a pilot. After that, it went on through a Nepali bank and all that, I agree to develop bank. And so, but so these successes are just not picked up. And then there's a huge orthodoxy that comes in, and every project, every uh, thing has to be defined. Now, my objections to aid orthodoxy is that there is no critical self evaluation. You know, I, we even use the word incestuous. The same sort of people who design the project probably come back after a stint somewhere else and come and evaluate it. So I have yet to see any evaluation report that really is critical. There were two examples I'll give you. One from the World Bank, uh, where a report called the Wappenhams Report. You can Google it and see it. They haven't removed it yet. And it was an independent kind of a review that really showed that most World Bank projects are a failure. You know? And the reason is very simple. It's designed so that you know you are in the World Bank. Let's say you and I are working in the World Bank. I push a five billion dollar project in, in in Nigeria, and you push a fifty million dollar project in Colombia. Your chance of promotion in the World Bank is about ten times more than mine. Number one. Okay. Number two. Once you push the project, you are not responsible for what happens to that project. You move on to other projects. You know? So there's an institutional destruction there. Okay. The other independent review is uh, the University of Helsinki. I was involved with that in in studying the impact of uh, water supply and forestry projects in Nepal through the FINIDA thing. It was a highly critical thing, but it was because the university was a separate thing and they did that. Similar story with the Australian University, National University that did the community forestry. But otherwise you find that these evaluation reports are a disaster. There is no self-reflection and critique at all. Now, there's a lack of towards our science, I mentioned it, you know. Uh, I'll get to that, but you know, Millennium Development Goals, the predecessors of this SDGs. Now, I'm a critic of SDGs, and I hope to be a critic of this one also. Uh, but uh, the MDGs, there's a lot of chest thumping in Nepal right now. That was a week, you know, the old Soviet expression, you know, to over fulfill your plan. Okay, so we over fulfilled our plan on MDGs. Nepal over fulfilled the goals on you know, girl child enrollment, you know, uh, whatever it is that, you know, death rate, uh, childbirth. Uh, you know, all sorts of things, we are way beyond what the MDGA this thing. The trouble is, you can't link it causally to any Nepal government policy. 
and any donor policy. It happened because of something else went on and what was it? Because of the Maoist insurgency, it was in the interest of every mother in every village to send her children away from villages because either they would be recruited by the Maoists or shot by the rebel army. Okay? So they went off in droves. Uh, in the last 15 years, our out-migration to the Gulf countries and Malaysia and Korea as laborers. Now, the bad, it broke up families, did all kinds of things. But essentially, they started sending 10 times more income back than they, if they had a job in Nepal. Now, that increase in remittance meant that there's a lot of, they bought better education for the children, better health, everything. And so the MDGs went up. But this had nothing to do with any donor policy or any Nepal government policy. So, now this I'm afraid is going to continue with the SDGs because the lesson has not been learned. Okay. Now, also with the development orthodoxy, lack of development is defined as uh, lack of money. But we see in Nepal that has nothing to do with it. Nepal government revenue, uh, and essentially we don't have any effective government right now. You know, we're in the same situation as Belgium was, you know, a long period with no prime minister, no government. Currently, too, we're in the same situation. Over the last almost five, seven years, we've been in a similar situation. For a country that has effectively no government, the revenue of the Nep of Nepal government is growing per annum at twice the growth rate of China. How does that happen? Remittance. Because people buy more, there's indirect taxation, VAT, all these things, and so the government revenue is increasing so fast. The, uh, there was a, a call for investment in a hydropower project that wanted 2 billion Nepali rupees. There was an oversubscription by 46 billion rupees. Similar story with other. So, the lack of money is not the problem. So, when development orthodoxy tries to define this as lack of uh, money, you're already on the wrong track. And um, uh, on climate change, and I have a piece that you might have seen in the blurb uh, where I wrote in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists why I think Trump is going to be good for climate change. Uh, my main argument is that, you know, after two decades of adaptation, climate adaptation funding in Nepal, our carbon footprint has doubled. <laughs> now, we are small to start with, but we should have gone higher. But it's doubled. Uh, most of our electricity, we are a hydro country, now most half our electricity comes from a dirty coal-fired plant in Bihar. You know, rather than generating our own hydropower, okay? Uh, so if this is what is happening uh, with, with this so-called climate adaptation funding, I'm happy that Mr. Trump has come around, not that I like the guy, you know, uh, but the problem is at least he's going to shake things up and maybe it will force northern development agencies USAID in particular, but let's not talk about USAID. He's going to, Trump is shutting it down. He's cutting the budget of the State Department by 28%. And all my USAID friends come to me and say, Can they find a job at my small NGO? I say, Take over my NGO for a sake and find your own funding after that. But uh, with 28% budget cut in the State Department, the USAID will probably not exist. Okay, but uh, uh, so there's going to be has to he, 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 Trump's uh, you know bull in a China shop attitude is going to force a lot of northern governments and northern development agencies to start rethinking a little bit more critically about why is it that all this massive funding. Now, I'll give you another example. Copenhagen, Nepal had what uh, eight cabinet ministers attending Copenhagen. 600 Nepalis in the delegation. Now, you would have thought that Nepal probably had some Nobel Prize winning stuff on climate change to showcase there. Nothing of the sort. It's just that every donor had money in every ministry on climate change, unspent money. And what better way to show policy impact than to take the minister on a junket? You know? Now, if this is what is happening with climate adaptation funding, shut it down. Get something more serious going on. Okay? Nepal's consumption of, uh, just in the year 2008-2009, Nepal's consumption of petroleum jumped uh, from uh, 300,000 kiloliters per year to 600,000 kiloliters uh, simply because the, it was opened up to the import of all these luxurious uh, uh, Pajeros, the SUVs, uh, cars, and uh, uh, all kinds of private generators and all that. So this is the direction we are going with all this climate adaptation funding. Can I ask yeah. you to round up? Yes. And, then we can give and with SDGs, now my own problem is if that is what happened with MDGs, SDGs are much, much more ambitious. You know, they're much, much, you see all those 17 goals, 169, whatever criteria and all that. 
my problem with the, with the SDGs and climate change is this very simply. Huh? First of all, these SDGs are what in Nepali foreign, foreign ministry and finance ministry people call unfunded mandates. There's no money, essentially. You know. So where the money will come from is doubtful. I doubt if with Mr. Trump around, there's going to be much money for these kind of things coming at all. Okay. Uh, I think Europe and all will be more worried about you know, Syrian refugees and others than far away in Nepal and other countries. It's also politically, my problem is it's so far away 50 years later, you know, with what happens with climate change. Political processes in our countries don't even last five years. You know, it's a normal term of a parliament. So what happens is, you know, governments last five months, say ten months, whatever. We have had 25 prime ministers in 25 years. Okay, and uh, so to think that the political system can even think of these long-term things is impossible. But it makes everybody look nice. You can always say, yeah, yeah, we're thinking about climate change, and it makes you look green. It makes you look nice without having to really do something about it. Okay, and uh, finally, it sanitizes the politics and it does not address the other drivers. <laughs> like, I get into spring, why springs are drying across the planet. It's impossible to get any government agency or anything or any donor agency to even look at it. So this is where I think uh, there's a lot of problems with development aid, a uh, lot of problems with uh, aid industry as it has grown, and uh, there's something serious that needs to be done about it, but we'll talk about it in the debate. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Deepak. I was quite enjoying that. And, uh... <laughs> Was, was 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 waiting for you to continue. And now I have to I have to say a few words. I wanted to to to, to try to uh, listen to what you had to say, so I could uh, somehow challenge you on, on, on some of those those issues. And and there seems to be two main uh, two main points that you brought to us today. One is that the 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 autopsy of aid has failed that the, the money invested since the Second World War uh, and the paradigm of a European centered view rolled out to the developing world has failed and uh, we, need, we need a rethink. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's, it's fair to say that when you look at the projects, global projects, there are indeed many lessons to be learned and those lessons need to be uh, taken forward. And I believe that the solution to, 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 to the richer countries supporting the poorer countries is not for them to say entirely, we leave you alone, we have failed, we have had projects, and where is the solution? I'll give you a personal example. I worked on Lake Malawi many years ago. I, I lived there for three, lived in Malawi for three and a half years. I, I worked on the lake. I was doing a technical job to do with a fisheries project. The job itself was very interesting, the science was, was terrific. We published lots of interesting papers. Uh, almost all of the team that I worked with went on to get nice jobs and good salaries. Mm. Um, but the Malawians, Mozambicans, and the Tanzanians who I worked with, some went back to their institutions, back to their low salaries. And some, uh, because they worked on our project, uh, found their career path into a, in a political way. Uh, even one person becoming the Ministry of Fisheries uh, 20 years later. So the question is, was that a success or was that a failure? That was an aid-funded project. It was funded by the Overseas Development Administration. It was a much higher budget than any science program. Uh, a science program would have given like one PhD and a little rowing boat and a few bags of ice to preserve the fish, and there only be small fish caught because it could be from a rowing boat. This program provided a purpose-built vessel from, uh, built in Wales, actually. It was actually built by a mining company in Wales. So we were all very concerned that the only thing that mining companies knew about was sinking shafts. So we were very concerned that, that they were, we would sort of, you know, somehow find a way going down on our boat. But they built a very nice boat, we did very nice work. The boat was donated to Malawi at the end of, of the project. And did it improve, improve sustainable fisheries? No, it didn't. I can't say. I don't think it improved the sustainability of fisheries. Should the project have been funded? Should the uh, capacity development infrastructure be put in? Should the people who were trained 
were, were trained? Should they have been trained? Should their careers have been fostered? I think the answer to that is probably yes. Were the lessons learned from that, um, from that scientific program funded by aid in terms of the sustainable fisheries of Malawi into the future? I think the question also is, is yes. So if you look for absolutes, if you look for absolutes in the, 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 the aid funding, you will be disappointed. And one of the problems which I, I see in hindsight, and I've seen it in many other cases, and some of you may be involved in this, is the short-term nature of the aid pulse. It's a pulse world. We, 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 we fund, we do nice work, the money dries up, and things either by some side they might continue in a sort of de facto way, or they collapse and people go off. Sometimes the trained people go off to the private sector. You could argue that is a diffuse capacity development because it helps the, the, the economy. So the solution to that example is not that those sort of projects should not be funded. But there has to be a rethink in terms of what is the longer term view. So rather than having a, you know, an eight million pound, as it was, or was it even more, pound project in Malawi over three and a half years in 1990, maybe it should have been an eight million pound project over 20 years in Lake Malawi, of which five million could have been spent in the three first three years to get the basis, and then this longer term funding. So the solution, or the problem, is not so much the principle of funding. It's the principle of the longer term governance and view of keep people in positions who are, you have trained, keep them there, keep them going, pay them you know, a, a, a reasonable salary and, um, and you will get development uh, uh, off the back of that. In the same way, I think Deepak also mentioned that the World Bank, uh, you know, the project of the World Bank had failed. And what I've been struck by the World Bank is, is, is the World Bank's a very generous organization. It's particularly generous in the per diems it, it, it dishes out. I was once in a situation, again, working on African fresh waters, where I ran a meeting in, in, in Dublin, or next west of Ireland, actually, and I invited a, a, a colleague from one of the partner countries. And uh, I had so much budget. I was on a research project now. I had so much budget. I invited a whole bunch of people. I said to them, I will buy your air ticket, and I will give you your accommodation, and I will give you 50 Irish pounds, as it was then, about 60 euros, in your pocket every day. And I thought that was very generous. I had an individual turn up to this meeting with a letter from his, and this is completely true, a letter from his director general reminding me very politely that the going rate for a daily per diem was $220. And so I'm left with a situation, okay, do I say, no way, Jose, or do I cough up the $220 in the interest of diplomacy and politics? I, I made the decision to cough up the $220, but I was very careful in the future of how I did things. And so there's a distortion. The problem is not so much that the funding is there, and it's not so much that the intention is wrong, it's the way it has been distorted in, for example, the funding regimes, and the way that uh, money often dissipates away from the core issues. So there are many, I know of very, very, very many nice Land Rovers which were running around the, uh, the Congo and Zambia and Tanzania, uh, funded or for GF project, but not so much to do with the actual nitty gritty of let's find out what's going on in that lake. The money was dissipated for political reasons. It becomes a political process and decoupling that aid budget and that aid, the politics of aid, and trying to decouple that uh, from the, the, so we say, the less attractive side of the political process is actually the way that we can, we can disseminate money in a more effective way. I'm currently also, I think we might share this view, and I think it is the way to go, that, that increasingly, you talked about having the toad's eye view or the top-down approach. You know, we fund from the top and we expect things to happen. 
In a way, we are paternalistic. We know best. We are currently involved, and, and, and many people in this institute are currently involved, working more at the community level. New Patrick said you want to go to the village. But you don't go to the village. You go to the village and you say, OK, what really is happening here? Not what do I think is happening, or what would I like to see or believe is happening, but what's really happening in order to build that bottom-up capacity at the appropriate level. So the appropriate level is not you know, giving everybody from a village in Uganda an opportunity to do an MSC. It will lead to frustrations. The appropriate level is a little bit of seed funding to enable people in a, in a microfinancing way to invest in their own capacity. And it's not a gift. It's a loan. And it might be an interest-free loan, and it might even be a loan which you accept you may never see any return, but the return is within the communities and building that responsibility within the communities to actually take the opportunity. And I think aid has suffered, uh, in my view, too much from the, this paternalistic view that doesn't give people the responsibility of using that money in the way that they feel fit. There are so many examples of, of, of projects being implemented with this is how to do it. And this is how to do it. If it doesn't take account of local circumstances, of course, it doesn't work. And I've seen that many times, and there are lots of records on that. And there are success stories, and success stories are about either local champions with local integrity and taking local ownership to actually build that, 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 to build that capacity and to take responsibility of it. And I firmly believe that, that, that the aid in the future, with or without Mr. Trump, needs to, to build that responsibility in a much more considered way and in a much greater way, for example, if you look at IAG as, a, as an example, where we need to build in, again, this longer term, uh, we talk about impact. But to have the impact, you have to actually be engaged for a longer term. You can't be engaged in a two-year DUP project and think you have impact. You need to extend it. So I think that's where I would like to see the money shifted. I don't have a problem necessarily with uh, reduction in, 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 in aid per se. But I think if we suddenly say, we step back and say, we shall stop aid because you know that gives people ultimate responsibility. You are, it's like the Russian roulette game. Maybe that's the inappropriate term these days to use. I don't know. But, but it's, a, it's a Russian roulette where things, uh, you leave things to, 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 chance. to the chance and to the vagaries of the local political and sometimes the local uh, corrupt or not such good government. So, 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 so there are some controls. And it's more of a of a guiding hand that I would encourage. Action Aid, I, 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 I interacted with some years ago. I thought I had a good model. Their model was to make themselves redundant. We're finishing, okay? We're, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Try and run. Okay. Their their model is to is to is to is is to make themselves within a country redundant. So they bring in the expertise, they're there for a number of years, and they are working with the counterparts in order that a certain point comes where they can step back and go, we don't need to be here anymore. And the action aid model, uh, from what I can see, has generally been a successful one. I just round up with uh, the thought about Mr. Trump. And uh, I think Deepak and I probably agree that we probably wouldn't want to go for dinner with him necessarily. <laughs> um, but I think Trump is a disaster for, for the globe. I think he's a disaster for international security. And I think he's a disaster for poverty alleviation. Because I don't think his policies will cause uh, a, a chain reaction to uh, for people to become more self-reliant. I think he will just cut the tap and actually leave people in a dreadful situation. For example, his cut of, uh, of, 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 uh, of clinics because of his, uh, the, the, some of the policies to do with funding, so fund, no funding can, be lead, can lead to family planning. That is like throwing the baby out, regardless of your view of a certain issue. 
if you have such a blunt instrument that you say we are now going to cut all funding to, uh, to, 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 to women and to children and to communities because of one component of that funding, you will lead to poverty and you will lead to higher mortality. And I think Trump will directly lead to an increase of mortality in many parts of the world. And that's why I, 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 I find his policies very disturbing. I could talk all night about Mr. Trump. I, 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 I don't necessarily want to, but I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay. Can I ask you to now react and and yeah. and okay. perhaps I'll do a slight suggestion because I think if I take it from what both of you said, you there are some points of disagreement. I think one disagreement or perhaps different use of different definition is that Ken is saying yes, perhaps aid orthodoxy has failed, but at the same time, many good things have happened. And perhaps, uh, if I rephrase it, what Ken said is if you look at it, if you look at the formal systems of formal reports, the formal systems of accountability, the formal <coughs> impact evaluations, perhaps results are not that positive. But if you look at what happened in the interstitial spaces, had those that, that, that are not reported, but that come through the continuous maintaining of relations in complex networks of funds, people, and stories, then a lot of interesting things happen. And so a slight uh, slanting of the, the way of looking at development as the maintenance of relations, perhaps. So that is, I think, Ken's counter-argument. Then what I found very, that's one point perhaps that is good to continue the discussion on. And the other point that is perhaps interesting, where I think you really disagree, is that Deepak is saying what is totally wrong with the aid system is that it, to it's, it continuously sanitizes politics. It leaves politics out. And that's where it goes wrong. Whereas Ken says, we need to even further deal <coughs> decouple technical aid from politics because when politics enters it becomes dangerous and um, ineffe ineffective. So I think perhaps these two points to start up the debate. Okay, can I? Okay. Uh, interesting. I think uh, we are we're, we're opening up this Pandora's box. Uh, very necessary because uh, yeah, Trump. I think whether we like it or not, he's going to bring this cold turkey thing. It's not a good thing. I agree with you, you know? and it's going to disrupt just about uh, anything. Well, the USAID is shut down. Imagine the number of countries they've been working on, and these projects will be left high and dry already. Already there is a uh, complete uh, uh, you know, stepping back. Nobody in the USAID I know really wants to take any initiative, any decision right now because their careers might be, you know, it's already shaken and they might go. So it is cold turkey. But I'm trying to see a silver lining in that because ultimately what happens is that, uh, and this is an answer to your second question on the sanitizing the politics. What has happened since 1985, we all observe in Nepal, mid-80s, is somewhere in the mid-80s, uh, Ken, the stuff that you talked about, the technocratic part of uh, uh, aid, uh, started getting lost. Uh, most development agencies, USAID, DFID, FINIDA, DANIDA, all this sort of stuff, huh? uh, they were up to that point still concentrated on development, you know, and trying to bring development in various ways, successful, unsuccessful, or whatever. Somewhere towards the middle with structural adjustment, what happened was aid started becoming more and more bluntly an instrument of foreign policy. And where this was expressed in Nepal's case was that the USAID office in the place called Ravi Bhavan is a huge complex. They, you know, they shut it down, they sold off the land, and now it's housed within the US Embassy. Now, you want to go and talk about an American aid project, you know, with your manager on fish farm or whatever, you can't enter there with your computer, you can't enter with your mobile phone, you can't enter even with the memory stick, you know. Now, if that is how they're going to manage securitized 
aid, uh, you know, say, why are you in the aid business at all in the first place, okay? So the question, the point I have is that I would agree that, you know, you don't throw out the baby with the bath water. What I'm looking at is a situation where Trump has already thrown out the baby with the bath water, I think. There'll be a resistance within the American community, uh, but I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing, you know, a sort of a hands-up kind of a thing. Uh, most people are just, you know, okay, what do we do now, you know? What I'm arguing is that, yes, there were success stories, there were uh, good ones, but the nature of aid also was distorted by the fact that first aid used to come to governments. And then, you know, that shifted in the 80s and uh, mostly in the 90s with this Washington consensus that uh, the developed countries dis decided, oh, third world governments are corrupt and uh, we don't want to fund them through third world governments. We're going to do it through NGOs on the one side and we're going to do it through uh, uh, the private sector. Now, the private sector doesn't exist. And what private sector came in the Enrons of the world? Remember that company? Oh, yeah. You know, people blame George Bush for many things. But the worst of Enron in India and Nepal happened under Bill Clinton. And much of that financing irregularity that led to the 2008 crash also happened with Tony Blair and Bill Clinton. You know, so we, we forget that. So what happened was, and with the NGOs, what happened is we, with the, well, I use an expression, you know, we got to distinguish between service delivery NGOs and activist NGOs. <laughs> Unfortunately, activist NGOs are getting less and less, not just in the south. In the north, they seem to have disappeared altogether, with the maybe exception of a few like uh, Greenpeace and you know, Oxfam to some extent and all that. Uh, very few. But most of them are now just tied to the business of raising funds. So you see most INGOs just more occupied with fundraising than actually getting the work done or actually trying to get some you know, serious institutional reform and change happening. So what I'm arguing is that you know, what we should do is you know, we should be prepared for what I call the end of the age of aid. After the collapse of the Berlin Wall, this aid thing that started after the Second World War, that age has ended. You know. Uh, we, you know, to save ourselves a lot of grief, we might as well accept that. And now talk about how to rethink international cooperation, where money and aid flow pay plays only a small part, an important part, all right, but not the dominating part it has become as an aid industry. Okay? Mm -hmm. That we should now talk about some of the best example in Nepal is, you know, we talk about hydropower and the World Bank's on the mess with Arun and all. But Best work at hydropower was done by a Norwegian missionary called Odd Hofton, who came, worked in Nepal, and not only that, he had capacity building. Here's a poor country, you know, we were completely like Japan isolated till 1951, we were completely isolated, you know. Um, and starting that late, with, with the people like Odd Hofton who came, we manufacture hydro turbines in Nepal. Uh, they set up some of the best workshop, one of the best engineering workshop is in Butuan now, where even the Chinese bring their turbines to be in Tibet to be repaired to Nepal. Is that good? But this is all thanks to this crazy Norwegian missionary, you know, who started all this capacity building. So it is possible to rethink development around those models and not have it as an instrument of foreign policy of foreign governments forcing this, that, or the other. So I think, you know, um, this whole thing about uh, USAID and different uh, uh, coming up with this slogan called doing more with less. It sounds so good, you know, putting more money in third world country, having a smaller uh, office in London or Washington. It sounds good. But no, that's bad, I say, because development is a messy, clumsy process, you know. And uh, it's not just about how much money you push through. Uh, the, our bureaucrats in Nepal, you know, they love this, you know, because it gives them a chunk of money and they can play around with it as they like, you know. And of course, all the corruption and kickback that goes with it. What you should have is the uh, the Dutch had this volunteer system, the Danish had that. I was on the advisory board many, many years ago. And they had a wonderful system where uh, volunteers came to work there. And uh, uh, they had what was called Objective B, which I said, what the hell is Objective B? He said, it doesn't concern Nepal, it's about Holland. Uh, or, or Denmark. I said, no, but I want to know. Well, it turns out that that objective B, which is forgotten by now, you know, is that, okay, you send in a bunch of volunteers to Nepal or Peru or wherever to work, and they do some good work building schools and all that, fine. But then objective B says, how does that help Holland or Denmark 
with these guys returning back and becoming better global citizens. Yeah. Did you see that? Even stronger now. Yeah, but that's lost now, you see? Yeah. That's lost. And that's what we should really, you know, sort of recover, yeah. that it's also the developed northern countries that need to be yeah. developed yeah. in the right way. Okay. Okay. Okay, very quickly, because I want to hear what people have to say. And I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So as well, Laura knows, I'm not a great fan of the comfy chair uh, uh, panel discussion, so I'm pleased that we don't have comfy chairs. Um, <laughs> you know, anyway, you know what I mean. Um, I think there's a solution, and I think it is back to activism. So I think it's about the kickback against the former paradigm, which we talk about, and you and you and you've said, and it's 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 the developing world or the global south, whatever term you wish to use, has been very willing to accept the dollars, yeah. and very willing to accept the conditions of those dollars, and even when there is blatant human rights abuses or blatant. Uh, uh, filtering of funds, large funds, I might add, you know, multi-million funds, there are vested interests which keep the flow of money going. Yes. And I think civil society and the institutions that surround that and the institutions within the agencies and governments can play a role in kicking back against those dominating forces. And I think in India, we are beginning to see some of that reaction of civil society going, hang on, this isn't working very well. This is either corrupt or it's not serving the purpose that we, that we, that, that we want to. And if you take an example, you mentioned hydropower. Hydropower is a really good example of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. And there are good hydropower schemes, and there are ugly hydropower schemes, and there are very dodgy financial laundering of money of hydropower schemes, including in the, in the Mekong Delta. And I think that the, that the increasing awareness, and for Oxfans, etc., not just to be money gatherers, but to be encouraged through civil society at the local level, and to build that awareness, to actually say, what are we receiving? What do we do with the money? which is coming. And I think there has to be a rethink with Trump. I just want to say, I think the, the last thing I want to say, really, is the SDGs are an extraordinarily ambitious global endeavor. And they have not been imposed upon the globe. They have been negotiated. Now, you can criticize, perhaps, some of the mechanisms. But the principle of engagement, this is a global experiment. It's the first time this has really happened. And it is now for the citizens of the globe to actually go, well, hang on. This could be, if you look at the planet, if you look at the, the, the reasons for the MDGs compared to the SDGs, or well, you look at the reasons for the Sustainable Development Goals compared to the Millennium Goals, it is about the protection of the planet. We are going to break our 1.5 degree centigrade barrier threshold above pre-industrial temperatures. We are going to move beyond that. We already have massive thermofrost melt and massive methane uh, emissions. We are, we, are, we, are, we are in the sixth uh, extinction, the sixth extinction on the globe. This one caused by human activity, not by uh, uh, meteor strikes, etc. So it's when the communication, when the citizens of the world actually go, well, hang on, there was something just not right here. And we have to fight against disinformation and misinformation and downright lies, which could also come out of some political uh, entities. And it's through education and through awareness and through little, little, shall we call them for want of a better word, Soviets, that influence everybody else. So each, one in the, each person in this room can create easily 20 activists, easily, who are not activists in on the street marching, but they're activists in terms of saying, we have to question what's happening. <coughs> and each of those 20 people who you influence can influence another 20. And so it goes on, and then you get a mobilized civil society that can make a difference. So, so that is my hope with the SDGs. That's Thank you. very nice. And then, so I, I see a very, two very nice questions on the table that perhaps are nice to start off the, to open up the debate with. And those are the calls of both Ken and Deepak, actually. I think it's something on which we more or less agree and not disagree, is a call for 
rethinking what is international collaboration and rethinking aid, not in terms of a donor country and a recipient country, but in terms of forging international relations of collaboration, how to do that, so to rethink that. And the second one related is how can all of us reclaim this, this space to become true global <coughs> citizens and articulate all the nice things that, and do the nice things that, that Kelly just said. I think those are very nice starting points to engage with many of the things that Deepak and, uh, and Ken said, but feel free also to react to anything else. The floor is open. Sandra. Hi, um, thank you. I could react on what you just said. You don't have to. I actually, you don't have to. The moment I hear you, uh, you both actually talk about uh, the SDGs, I still have the idea that you're talking about um, only aid. While, in my opinion, the Sustainable Development Goals are not just aid, and they are actually a governmental thing, so you can't even split that away from each other. Um, these, are, these, these things have not been uh, discussed by, the, by aid uh, systems. These things are discussed by the governments in the UN system to actually hold all countries um, to these goals and not just development countries or however you want to call them. Um, and actually a lot of developed countries will also not be, well, they will fail in, in a lot of these kind of things. Especially, for example, on climate change. You're already failing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, I was, I think I missed that a lot in, in, in the, the points you made. Um, so, yeah, I was kind of curious. Can I make a very brief response? I don't want to give the impression for one second that I think the SDGs are only about aid. They are certainly not. They are about responsibility and about a recognition of the things that we need to fix at every country. And one of the things which I like about the SDGs over the MDGs is that it's not only targeted to you know, the poor and the developing world and to the global south. It's actually targeted to every, in each and every country. So each and every country has its targets and has its responsibilities. And what I see the aid uh, connection is that the aid funds can be used to facilitate some of the SDG mechanisms. And the aid, uh, perhaps in the not too distant future, we have to seriously consider actually funding some of the targets that the SDGs have laid out. So for Nepal or something, you know, maybe somebody has to go, well actually, in terms of an ecosystem service, to use a term I'm familiar with, we need to look after some of those glaciers and some of those rivers in Nepal, because that's to everybody's benefit. And so I think it's a facilitation. It's, it's, I don't see it as a separate thing at all. Can I, okay. can I, can I yeah. respond to that? Okay. I'm going to pick up something you said, you know, this activism. Okay. Now, that's the key, I think. If SDGs are going to succeed, they're not going to succeed because of how governments did this and how they fulfilled it. They're going to succeed if there is activism that holds governments accountable. Now, this is a wonderful thing to me just for one reason. It is that I can catch the government by the throat and say, you signed up to this damn thing. <laughs> okay. What have you done? Okay. And uh, so that's where. Now, fail activism this is going to be a meaningless thing. Mm -hmm. Because lots of things are going to fail there. Like, you know, we just mentioned that northern countries are already failing on <laughs> the emissions, okay? And we're already failing on God knows how many other things. Okay. But that activism, now, this is the challenge I have uh, before the academia, actually, not just in the south, but also in the north, that we are, okay, we produce PhDs and masters and all sorts of things, you know. But then the question has to be asked, Okay, you do these very fancy, you know, learn fancy tools and do all these fancy things. Huh? So, why are you doing this? 
you know, what do you hope to do with it 20 years from now? Yeah, yeah some of us will earn a lot of money doing consulting or something of that sort. But that really cannot be the goal. You know, that really cannot be the goal. Because you have to go back to relate to your society as you see it, either at the local level or at the global level, you know, and say and feel the passion. So if that passion is missing and activism is driven by passion of how strongly you feel certain things and it's helped by very much by uh, intellectual rigor if there is and my con complaint with a lot of the activists in India and Nepal is you know it's all heart and very little head. Eh? So put a little bit of head also and it helps. Okay. So but if that happens then these things can be meaningful but I'm not seeing that. Uh, I'm not seeing okay, that at that, all. That's a challenge in all of you guys. <laughs> Which, awesome. I mean, you have so much to say about uh, SPDs. I mean, these are enormous goals, so uh, um, big to achieve, and and, and, and all the governments do agree to, to achieve these. But these are these are very complex. These are very complex to achieve. I mean, you agree, both of you agree that these are these are uh, there are mechanisms for monitoring, there are mechanisms for some things. But because of that. There is a lot of confusion. Whatever is done in the name of uh, investment or other infrastructure development is linked to SDGs. By, for example, I give you in the example of China, for example. Lots of investment is happening, in, for example, in my country, in Pakistan, and that's being linked to SDGs. Because it's so all encompassing that. You find it. <laughs> so so you, you link it you know, with us easily. But then, then it can come with a lot of costs as well. For example, look at the investments in, in Africa, and, and governments do welcome these kind of investments. I mean, they, they have signed to these goals, but still they, they welcome these kind of investments at the cost at, at the cost of maybe environment, at the cost of other, but, but they have to show the progress. And that's one way of showing it. I can see it in there's a big uh, investment coming in Pakistan building from Kashmir not to the south, like have all the infrastructure, but that will be cost. So, so the, the, the danger with these kind of goals is that they are good, they are ambitious, but then it's very hard to, to, to uh, really uh, judge or, or stop things that, that can affect you know uh, society in, in a negative way. I mean, I mean, they, there are really these are good goals, but there are lots of challenges. That, that's my point. I want to say that. Can I, can I respond? See, you raise a valid point. Uh, my argument is that uh, uh, if you look at uh, Kyoto Protocol, for instance, and I have a colleague who's done a brilliant chapter in a book, I also have a chapter called Clumsy Solutions for a Complex World, where he argues that uh, the title is very provocative. It says, is Kyoto Protocol merely useless or positively harmful? And the argument is, it's positively harmful. Why? Because Without that critical activism and without that, uh, you know, that sort of stuff, uh, what happened was it was completely confined to what I choose to call procedural fetishism. You know, it's all procedures, you know. Now, I'll give you an example in Nepal. Now, we should have been, you know, to address climate change issues, forget Kyoto, forget Copenhagen, forget Paris. We should have been cutting down our fossil fuel use and going for hydro and solar uh, like there was no tomorrow. Unfortunately, because of Kyoto and because of all these things, the procedural fetishism, what happened was even <coughs> rather than going and building these things on a no regret scenario, you know, building hydro or building solar would not really harm. There's a no regret part to it. So said, well, let's wait. Maybe we'll get some money from clean development mechanism, which never came. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we lost 20 years. Yeah. So this is where this, there's a danger that <coughs> without the activism, you might end up putting, uh, you know, getting lost in procedural fetishism rather than something substantive. And so the academic community has to be, I think, more critical now. Uh, not just accepting all this, even the goals have to be challenged constantly, you know, to put people on their toes. Yeah, okay. Tatiana. So, <clears throat> I wanted to say two things. The first one is that when we talk a little bit about activism and when we look at uh, like World Bank projects or other development projects as, as having been accepted or the money, like it's I think aren't we being a little bit anachronic because there has been activism, a lot of activism. I mean, during the 70s, during the 80s, there have been huge resistance to water wall bank projects, not only on hydropower, but you know, uh, like the the, the the big privatization uh, projects during the 90s. So hmm, I don't think that there, like, there's always been activism. 
that it's also, of course, caught in the dynamic of finding funding. But uh, I don't think uh, all of it has been caught. I, I don't know. I, I think it's a bit anachronic to think, oh, we need more. There has always been activism. Uh, and there has always been resistance to development at any price. The second thing is that, like, what I, uh, what makes me very suspicious about the develop, sustainable development goals, uh, it's that, well, there is a focus on social and uh, cultural rights, um, the economic rights and perhaps more political rights, like uh, instead of reduced inequalities, the redistribution or, 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 or I don't know, historical reparations is completely out. So in that way, it is already very sanitized. It is already very depoliticized. Uh, so yes. like, uh, I don't see how that is going to change. Like the status quo, the big inequalities that are making uh, things to go as business as usual? Two small things. One is that I think, you know, we can think of activism in terms of, yes, the protests, you know, the Greenpeace protests, the protests against, you know, logging, the protests that you are uh, familiar with and you are referring to, and of course that has been activism. In a very sort of political, very focused political way, actually, and in a very antagonistic way. And I think the, 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 what I would like to see is, some, is a greater lower level activism, but in a, more, in a much broader way, to go, this is in everybody's interest. And it's not, it can't then be hijacked by you know, large corporations. I mean, for example, there is a current court case of uh, a large logging company which is suing Greenpeace for activism in Canada. Now, if the corporation wins, uh, Greenpeace could actually be more or less shut down because of the money is so large that they've been sued for. So the idea then is to say, well, what's the root of this problem? The root of this problem actually is because people buy books. And if people actually, the people who buy the books say, well, we don't want to use the paper that's used for this, it becomes a much more lower, and this becomes an economic activism, and that has an impact. And if, been following, if you've been following some of the American politics recently, which is, I, I have become almost obsessed with it, I'm afraid, you see where, you know, actually things happen because people withdraw their economic support. Suddenly, people who make outlandish statements on cable news programs suddenly move, get moved because advertisers go, well, actually, this isn't good business. So there's different <laughs> levels of, 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 of activism. Uh, in, that an engagement. In that an engagement. Yeah. Maybe yeah. engagement yeah. is a better yeah. word. And it's, it's a sort of intelligent engagement. And I think yeah. the other thing which we have to be <coughs> careful of is just when we think about reaction to economic systems, which you, which you touch on, and the redistribution of wealth, which you, which you touch on, which we, we recognize as a problem. This is not like it or, you know, whether you like it or not, this is not how the, the capitalist functional world operates. And so one has to engage with the capitalist paradigm in order to address this, which is a very difficult thing because it's a sort of the market driven uh, process, which in a neoliberal world is not going to help poor people. So this is what has to be engaged with uh, in an intelligent way. And, and so there was, there's some very uh, nuances here, I think. And so, so, no, this is probably first, Sorry, I don't know your names. So, <laughs> for, so go ahead. Uh, my question is, what do you think about sanctions instead of aids? I mean, like, if Thanks. you said, like in Nepal, you said you should have been already uh, built lots of like solar projects or hydropowers, yeah. but because of these aids coming in the future, so people that stepping back, yeah. yeah. But what about what if there are sanctions? Uh, you also mentioned Kyoto Protocol or other like. Uh, yeah, now it's over in India. Yeah, so but sanctions in what sense? Sanctions in terms of. Um, Punishments for not. And who punishes whom? Uh, who? Who? The 
and most of the white hey, like I'm Iranian, okay? So the nuclear deal was stopped because of sanctions. Because like they said, okay, we're not buying your oil anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then our government like, yeah. stepped back yeah, and said, okay, take whatever yeah. you want. Well, there's a, there's a discussion this week, which has just started, as far as I can talk and see, which is about sanctions against the US by European yeah, producers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Europe can say to the US, well, actually, you know, it's all very well, Donald saying, we don't need, you know, we're not going to support you under Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, which if you're familiar with that. Um, and the reaction, if you have been following this, this is a very dramatic week, because Merkel from Germany actually says, well, we cannot rely on the US anymore. Effectively, that's what she said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this is a, this, this is a, a heart back, back to Truman. This is, this is 70 years of, 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 of a US-Europe alliance actually being shattered Absolutely. in one week. And what are the, the, the reactions to do? Because you know, America first isn't going to be America first if trade with the rest of the world is sanctioned. So maybe there's a way of yeah. doing sanctions in a very sort of different sort of way than traditionally we've, we've, we've viewed it. I, I have problems with sanctions. You know, I mean, I'm not sure that the, uh, the Iran thing really worked because of the sanctions. I think there were some other forces at work, uh, pragmatism uh, on both sides uh, that said, you know, this can't go on. Now, I uh, had an argument with a Swedish diplomat on this, you know, on the sanction on Russia. I said, Russia is just too big a country to sanction. They can survive in 300 years of selling timber. You know? uh, such a big country, they have time zones. But I said, I, sanctions don't work. I said, I'm not talking Iran, I'm not talking Russia. And for heaven's sake, I'm talking Cuba. Cuba. You know, right off the American coast, they've sanctioned them for 50 years, and Mr. Castro was just as, you know, you know, hell and hardy right till the end. It didn't work. So it required America to go back and say we need to do some other engagement. So I think it's engagement that produces better results uh, than sanctions. Sanctions have a hoobery, I think, especially among the Americans, that, you know, they think that just because they try and sanction things, it doesn't work. Yeah. People they try to sanction that's that's right. have, uh, this. Uh, also, someone whose name I do not. So, yeah, you, <laughs> <laughs> I know, but the, I'm yeah. yeah. in the order. <laughs> no, I have some uh, <coughs> some different ideas. Like, um, in my perceptions, I think the I think the failure of the development made. We should not blame directly to the, 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 the donor agencies. I think the failure is because of some reasons behind this, like the weakness of the government and the mentality of the, the, the local people as well as the government. And the uh, third point, what I want to highlight is that how the, the development aid project has been designed in terms of the sustainability and the ownerships. There are some cases like. Uh, the weak, in terms of the weakness of the government, like what they, they have to force the donor agencies, like, oh, this is our reason, so you have to invest the, your money based on our reasons. So this is our master plans. But in a, the weakness of the government is like, they update the master plans. So they implement first, and then they update the master plan. That is the very weakness of the government. So, that's what I've seen. And another point I have, what I have in my perception is like the, the, the design, how they design the projects. The failure is on that one. Like, there is a, for example, I would like to give like, a lot of worship by projects. It is already 30 years and it's still sustainable. It's a donor funded project. And it was a demand driven project. So it's not forced by donor agency, it was demanded by the local community. So it's a, it should be like that. So it should be a demand driven project. And what? They, they incorporate one component in the uh, design process, like uh, what they did, like it was a community-based process, and they make a community, uh, the, the president of the community member, they make the, the person who lives on the downstream side of the community. So the, the person who has a house in that... Tell the, tell and tell and yeah. Tell and is the president of that project. <laughs> so he has to be very active in the operation and the maintenance of that project, otherwise he will have, he will have no water in his house. And that project is a demand-driven project and is sustainable for more than 30 years. 
Uh, my quick uh, answer to this is this. Yeah, I mean, uh, if projects have been designed, uh, I've always maintained that you know when you have you would blame uh, has to be apportioned. I always say that 60% of the blame has to come to us because we ultimately agreed to this nonsense, and 40% maybe to the external donors and all that. Again, you can debate whether it is 60, 40, 40, 60, whatever. But I'll tell you one thing: the southern governments are not as powerless as made out. There's a brilliant PhD thesis, I par partly supervised that, out of the University of Helsinki by a girl called Erya Heinenen huh? and University of Helsinki. You can get that. It's a, it's a, she did a PhD on the water supply schemes in Nepal and the policy the changes. It's, it's one of the most brilliant theses I've read because, you know, she shows that how southern bureaucrats, Nepali bureaucrats, could run rings around the World Bank and USAID and everyone, everything, yes. and, and, and get what they wanted. Even local governments, municipal governments. Yes, they, they could do that. It's brilliantly catalogued. She's done that, okay? So the question is that uh, if projects have been designed or interventions have been designed bottom up towards I, you know, with uh, demand driven, call it what you will, many instances I can show you where they have worked, okay? But unfortunately, we are talking about these global kind of designs where, yes, you know, there was some consultation, but then you find out that that consultation never went below the national government level. Okay? And uh, as a result, I'm not really hopeful that, you know, even if the money comes through, which is number 17, I don't think it will come through at all, but even if it does, uh, there's a good chance that this kind of running of rings around uh, donors, our, our bureaucrats are past masters. I mean, they have seen all this. <laughs> yeah. 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 Ruth, you also had a question. I was just going to make a point about sanctions that, in my uh, experience reading about them, they always seem to affect the wrong people. They affect yes. the children, the yeah, poor. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's very much against them. A couple of other points. Um, you were talking, Ken, about um, activism at a, a sort of grassroots level, which in theory I think is great. I certainly like the idea of not always preaching to the converted, because all this at this level is always engaging the same people who probably are often thinking with their hearts, also intelligent people, but you know, they are often academics or intellectuals. But getting to the people at grassroots level is hard, and also holding governments to account is a luxury in a democracy that so many countries don't have. Mm -hmm. A, yeah. the information is not available, but B, if you were to write a blog about it, for God's sake, yeah, yeah. you would have yeah. to see the next day. Yeah. So there are these huge obstacles, I think. Yeah, that's that goal about this one, is it, you know, what governance or whatever that is, you know. But, uh, yeah, that's going to be a huge challenge. It's, 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 it's a huge challenge. My concern, and this came out previously also, you know, also the stuff you said, is uh, I am not as uh, optimistic as you are. Yes, there is activism, but unfortunately I'm seeing that in the, the activism of the 80s and the 90s was the high point, in a global sense I'm talking about. Huh? Somewhere towards the 21st century, way down. No. Yes, we still have, you know, the, there's one good activist in Nepal left, you know, young guy. But uh, most of these guys are lost. They've been co-opted co completely, you know, not just co-opted in a financial sense, they're also co-opted intellectually. And as a result, they are not in the critical mode that they should be, most activists should be on the critical mode. Uh, that's their Part of their religion, that's what they should be doing. But most of them are turning out to be cheerleaders for any program the donor brings about. Yeah. We had a horrible case in Nepal once when the USAID announced that they had money for aid awareness, and overnight 27 NGOs were registered that just did exactly AIDS awareness, and most of them you found out were relatives of the government secretaries and all that, you know. I mean, this is the kind of nonsense that's going on. So activism is dying because there's too much pursuit of money. And I really love to see more activists who are not really, who, who are motivated by something else, some other calling, uh, rather than this thing. And to blame, and this is where I blame the donors now, you know, that the, the, the co-optation of the NGOs happened so brilliantly and so horribly. Uh, we've lost some of the best journalists, you know, who are very critical writers. And you say, where are they now? And you find out some are working for DFID and some are working for USAID. They're no longer writing critical pieces anymore. 
you know, they made a meme by that, but then they got co-opted. It happened to university professors in our part of the world because more than teaching, they are all running around doing projects for different donors, you know, uh, hardly seen in class. Uh, this is going on. So this is where the problem arises and this is where when the challenge gets much bigger and when Mr. Trump looms on the horizon, there is really nothing countering him. I am not seeing that intellectual counter. My Berkeley professors, I got a long response to that article of mine on why Trump is good for climate change. He said, yes, yes, activism is starting. I said, no, it hasn't started yet. Yes, you spent your uh, frequent flyer miles to send a PhD student to Washington, D.C. on that uh, science march or something. Yeah, but that's, yeah, that's good, but that's hardly enough. I mean, you know, forces coming out now uh, out of the woodworks uh, when you have an oil company chief that's a state secretary and U.S. State Department is under him now, can I go to the USAID even with a, with a kind of proposal of social justice? So this is where the problem is. And so it's for the academic community, I think, really where you know, some real uh, intellectual criticality has to come out. <coughs> Go ahead, I also don't know your name. Hi, I'm Lisa, I'm from the ISS in The Hague. I just wanted to add to that, I think uh, we as researchers actually have a responsibility to be scholar activists as well. And that's really the concept that we've discussed a lot in the ISS, is where researchers move uh, beyond just research into practice, where they co-create um, solutions with communities instead of just studying them. So I think that maybe adds to the kind of engagement that we as intellectuals need to make. Um, but one of the observations that I've also made from my own research um, is that activism is also slowly dying down because uh, of uh, this trust in democratic mechanisms that are not functioning in developing countries and uh, where people protest but they see no difference. And yeah, maybe I can just... Uh, uh, illustrate what's happening in South Africa, which is where my research is focused, is that there is a big drought and basically what happened in small towns is that uh, the crisis were handled really badly and water systems collapsed completely and the water supply system was cut off for more than six months. But um, I really expected some form of protest or conflict when I went to the three research sites, but there was nothing. People just accepted it and they went on. And I think that kind of political apathy really comes from a distrust in the government. So mm -hmm. I don't know how one would get communities to become active, given that. I think you, you touch on something which is really very fundamental, and I don't have a solution to it, unfortunately, but I think you, you touch on something very fundamental. And it's, it's, it's what is it? And it's like it's a research question in a way. What is it that makes communities so passive in those situations? Mm -hmm. And it's not just South Africa. I can tell you an anecdote from, from Ireland where, where there was a, mm -hmm. uh, a town in the west of Ireland, a large town actually, uh, which had a cryptosporidium, this parasite in the water, very, very dangerous uh, parasite. So cryptosporidium was, in, was, was contaminating the water supply. So the water supply of the city was actually shut down for months. And a large water company uh, made a huge amount of money by selling their bottled water at half price in, in a big containers. During that period, there was uh, the Water Framework Directive policy of uh, European policy, uh, which had public participatory, uh, it had stakeholder workshops, and it had a public participation workshop in the center of this city, of which I think 33 people turned up. So this was in the middle of a, 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 a city of, you know, affluent city where people couldn't drink the water and couldn't drink the water for months, and yet 33 people went to the water policy stakeholder meeting. So that apathy, I think, is, 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 is intriguing because you are right, and when it is clearly, when there is an environment where people can voice their opinion, and they don't voice their opinion. And I think that's a hugely important question. Well, this fatalism, I mean, this is a subject that, uh, in the kind of social science I do, called culture theory, you have four <coughs> organizing styles. You have bureaucratic hierarchism, market individualism, egalitarian activism, you know, and you have fatalism. Uh, voter and consumer fatalism. You know, this is a thing. Now, it's each one of the other three are trying to influence that 
fit this crowd to do things and accept them according to what they want. The, the market wants them to continue buying shoddy products, you know. Uh, the government wants them to continue following unfair laws, you know. But it's up to that activist egalitarian community to really, you know, educate and sort of incite them, you know. But what is happening, and I, I you know, South Africa, I'm reminded of my own country, there comes a point in a country's kind of a history where there's a sense of betrayal mm -hmm. uh, by the intellectual community, <coughs> by the political class. Like in Nepal right now, uh, you had a Maoist insurgency. Now Maoist insurgency gives a very different center role we know so Peru and all that. Huh? Well, in Nepal, they all turned out to be billionaires. <laughs> now, that has led to a lot of that you know, that, that resentment. So when you try to talk political activism, you know, people just look at you and say, oh, which which party did you come from? Or, you know, um, are you another con, con man that's come by? You know, we've seen enough of them, you know. So task has become very, very difficult. And this is even globally true also. But that's, let's, uh, oh, let's first have Mona and then Tatiana and then perhaps both of you a last word. Thanks for the discussion. I just asked, like, we were talking a lot about activism and it has to come down. But uh, why is it activism? I don't know. You, like, there was a question that in the 80s and 90s there was activism was a peak and it came down. My hypothesis is that like, we guys have become so self-centric. Like, uh, we somehow feel that we, there is nothing to fight for. Like, my grandfathers were fighting for independence, my father for social justice. But now that I have everything, what should I fight for? Like, uh, I don't really see, it feels the need that I really have to go to the street and fight hard for something and then even if I ask for something, I don't get it. So if I'm refused twice, I don't go and ask, ask for it thrice. That happens at the institute, that happens everywhere. So isn't, what, there, isn't that this with the question of the global citizenship and the solidarity concept? Yeah, because like uh, now, now somehow we feel that we are all small islands, like even though we are connected, we don't really see the need to go and fight in the street. I don't know how uh, you see that. But this is why I think Mr. Trump is so good. He's forcing people now. You know, people I knew in America who would never think of activism, you know, uh, even people who were consultants, you know, who come out, they're all up in arms, you know. I said, good. I haven't seen this for a long time. Maybe nothing will come out of it, but hopefully, you know, yeah. you'll get the American civil society activist community now, you know, coming back to react because yeah, yeah. Uh, this, this guy is such a, you know, blow to everything. And inventing new, new forms of activism. Yeah, really well. So we don't know. Yeah. And it'll happen in every society in its own way. Yeah. Uh, because every society has gone through its own kind of history. And that history determines a lot of uh, the trust. It determines a lot of other things. <laughs> yeah. Tatiana, you want to say something too? No, I just wanted to like be a little bit the uh, yeah, party pooper. Right. <laughs> <laughs> narratives about apathy. Uh, about? Because apathy and about how uh, let's activate the people so they will become activists. Mm -hmm. Because I think that when you stay in a place like I don't know, long enough or, or or I think there are different ways of mm -hmm. like activism that are going on and perhaps communities will be very wary to be like related to communists or whatever. But they will in they, they will engage in activism in other ways, by voting for one or, or the other, or by, I don't know, there are, like, commitments are very complex and wicked, like, uh, so I, I just don't like, like, ah, no, they are like that because they are, oh, this is happening to them and they don't react. They are so ap apathetic. I, I think that's also, like, I think that is a little bit naive. Uh, of course they are doing something, but they just don't, perhaps, don't know. It was just well, I think that it is that respect here. I think the examples we've heard, I mean, example that I was eyewitness, <laughs> and the example that you've given from some South Africa, that would appear on the face of it to be quite an apathetic response to something which is not in people's interest. Of course, there are other situations where, where people, communities mobilize at all different levels. And on one hand, you look at South Korea in the last, uh, in the last six months, where you know, people filled the streets until the prime minister went. Um, and went, well, yeah, Venezuela is slightly different, but yes, okay, you're, you're, you're right. So activism, of course, but it's, it's on so many different scales. 
And understanding those scales, I think, is, is the point I was making. Not that you know we are saying, oh, everybody's so apathetic. I didn't actually say that. I was I used two. I picked up on an exa one example and I showed another example. Yeah. But then we hear also of of, of people mobilising. And what I said earlier was. There are different levels of activism. It doesn't have to be on the streets. It, it, it can be in a different, in different ways. Uh, and maybe we need a multitude of of the types, a typology of activism. Maybe not a typology. We already do, we do many. <laughs> do you want to say so yeah, much okay. to debate? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, this has been an interesting uh, discussion. Uh, we all in our own societies will face different problems. Uh, some environmental problems, some social justice problems, some whatever. And I think uh, it has to be rethought. But at the global level, there are also certain emerging common concerns that are coming out. Now, the question to me is, uh, again, addressed to both the academic community, uh, and this is this, that uh, if you have a wicked problem, a wicked problem can only be addressed uh, or tackled through what we choose to call uncomfortable knowledge. Our mantra is wicked, problem, uh, wicked problems, uncomfortable knowledge, clumsy solutions. Uncomfortable Uncom knowledge probably got you into the problem in the first place. You know, textbook engineering or whatever. So you have to be, the academic community has to be more active itself in generating uncomfortable knowledge that will make governments unhappy, north and south, that will make funding agencies unhappy and all. Unfortunately, what is happening is much of the research agenda is being defined by the funding available. Mm -hmm. And that's where the real problem is coming out. And in the funding also, I am finding out, I am getting more and more irritated as I get older and I find less reason to be <laughs> uh, You You have very bright people in these funding agencies who I call gatekeepers. They didn't like it when I had to say this. You know, I said, there is something called gatekeeping, you know. So they are there, they've got their PhDs and all that, but rather than sitting and doing actual research, they're sitting there judging the research of others and what can be funded and what cannot be funded. I call them gatekeepers. There's a brilliant um, American professor, he's Iranian, I'm trying to recall his name, I'll come in a second. But he's written a brilliant book about the sociology of intellectuals, uh, Max Weber and the sociology of intellectuals. And he defines this gatekeeping function. He calls it the sacrifice of intellect. Yeah. So people who've got brilliant PhDs and all, rather than going out and doing their own research, doing their own stuff there, go and join some funding agency and then become gatekeepers. You know, oh, you're a professor, you submitted this, sorry, your research can't be funded, you know. I think you've experienced that, I've experienced that, you have. And this is to me really, really, this gatekeepers, uh, uh, we have a system, we are now defining a global system in the north and the south, where uh, uh, you don't even trust your own professors, you don't even trust your own senior bureaucrats, and you have so many rules and regulations, and these gatekeepers are in charge. And this is really stymieing critical uh, you know, research. So I'm arguing that what we really need to do is pluralize the voices in the yeah. table, yeah. Uh, get more, more voices heard. And uh, I'll conclude by saying that we really need to worry about three types of innovation. Unfortunately, when we talk innovation, we only talk of technical innovation. No, technical innovation, the market is really good at. Governments don't do technical innovations. But governments also have to innovate in the sense that the, to address new challenges brought about by internet, whatever, you need to innovate with new management systems, mm -hmm. not technical. And that is not happening with many of the governments and others, you know, that be it. But then that is not sufficient. You also need, in the egalitarian community, the activist community, you need innovation, which we call behavioral innovation. Because these are behavioral changes that come from value systems and assertion of justice and things like that that define what the value system is. Okay? So these three types of innovation are where really I, I'm really worried about. I'm not seeing that two other coming out. I'm seeing a lot of fancy iPads and iPods and all sorts of things, technical innovation coming. But where is the behavioral innovation coming? Where is the uh, managerial innovations coming? And that is not coming. And so this is where I see the problem. Okay. One last word for Ken. Oh, last word. I don't want to. I don't want to. No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. I just wanted to give us an opportunity because one of the things that was mentioned in the in the discussion was engagement produces better results. And I, I'm wondering whether you want to see a four minute and sixteen second video 
about, which is, you may have seen this already, but I saw it this week for the first time, and I thought, this actually, when we talk about Trump and we talk about the difficulties of the world, uh, this is not a bad uh, little snippet to, to make us think. And it goes back to Ostrom, I think, this famous social scientist, who, if I'm right, my faith, and you all know better than me, her principle was, you know, when people are really antagonistic, to cause each other, getting them in a room to talk is always a good idea. And that, I saw that myself, I'm from Ireland, and I saw that in Northern Ireland, where the, the fractions who were killing each other actually eventually started to speak to each other. And over 20 years or 10 years, this backroom talking actually had an impact. So I, you may have seen this, and I, by the way, I hate Heineken. I want to say that. <laughs> it's not an ad for Heineken, but yeah. So before you start, just because it, 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 it's, it's, it's very close to the, the closing words I have in mind, is that I like the discussion about activism and engagement, and I think it's very good to think about it also, in not just in terms of marching the streets and protesting, but also in finding the spaces. Yes. Finding the spaces where there is room for negotiation. There's so much pressure on all of us to comply. And no, no more questions. No, I have to ask. Oh. For activism. Okay. <laughs> There's so much pressure on all of us, we know this, to comply, to go with the system, to make careers, to, to, to do the comfortable knowledge, eh, and to, 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 uh, be, to, to tell donors what they want to hear, to tell governments what they want to hear. But there's also always spaces. There's spaces, sometimes they're small, sometimes they're bigger, and we can make them bigger. And, and, and sometimes it, so the, sometimes the change is not the big change, the, the throwing, the, the revolution, but sometimes it's in these spaces where you can actually make a difference. So go ahead. I a, a small video, I think this is a very, let's, before the video, let's give a big Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Both of you, I think it was wonderful. It was a very good start of the PhD seminars, and I hope to have many more. Okay, thank you, Muppet. I'm just going to sound, so I hope it's working. Okay, we'll see. Um, in the meantime, in Netherlands, they have an SG cafe where groups come together and look for action. <laughs> so if you are interested, ask me and I can come, get me in contact with that. But that's for Dutch uh, SDG campaigns, but well, it would still be interesting. Yeah. Action, or climate change. At least that's how you could look at it. Yeah. Try it again. I would describe my political views as the new right. I'd say that in the action. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
next to the people who <coughs> just attend the next show. You seem quite ambitious and positive, and you've really um, got to go. <laughs> just to your order is pretty cool. I'm sensing, are you uh, for military or something? Who said that? But there is no military. There is no military. So are you then? Ex. Ex military? Um, yeah. If you're ex military, I'm probably better to deal with it. Oh, what's that? I grew up uh, in a bit of a I've experienced homelessness, I know what it's like to have absolutely nothing. Yeah. So I'm um, definitely most grateful just, just for life. We've only really just met, but I think we're all sort of birds of the world listen to me, you know, we'd have a discussion rather than oh yeah, you can hang out with like it's kind of